Hello everyone, this is a talk that I gave to the Guild of One Name Studies regional meeting in Perth, Scotland on the 2nd of November 2013 and I've been asked by people further afield if I could record the talk and put it online for them to share as well. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, I was talking about how my One Name study has evolved over nearly 30 years, how it's changed in terms of data gathering and getting information out there which I think is quite interesting. I started as a really young genealogist. I was only 12 when I went up to New Register House, the General Register Office for Scotland to trace my family tree. I didn't realise it at the time, but I was apparently underage. Um, there was an age limit of 16 or something or other that you were meant to be before you were allowed into the building and to look at these valuable old certificates and other documents. And well, nobody told me that. I trace all branches of my family tree, every single male and female line, which means I'm never really stuck for something new to look at. And as an example of just how much I do this, Cavers, which is my registered one name study surname, is the surname of my mother's father's mother's father's mother. So it really is far, far up the family tree. It's a name that means quite a lot to me though, because it passed down to my granddad. My granddad was Thomas Cavers Hall Dodds, and it's also a name that's been passed down as a middle name to an aunt of mine. And when I started tracing my family tree in the mid 80s, I quickly realised that most Cavers people in 19th century Scotland at least were related to me. And then it turned out to be 19th century Britain as well. And I, I thought maybe I should start gathering references to the surname because it's going to help me piece together my family tree. Now, the surname comes from Cavers Parish in Roxburghshire, which is near my hometown of Hoyk. It does not come from Cavers Car in Bowden Parish, and that's what Black Surnames of Scotland says. And this is just a, a warning. Don't take what surname books say as reliable, because I, I suspect that Black probably didn't know about Cavers Parish in Roxburghshire. He'd, he'd maybe come across Cavers Car and didn't know about the rather more significant parish name. Um which was well known to local um, officials, the people who kept census returns, the people who recorded civil registration events and so on. So um, it's a very well known name and it also means that the name doesn't have that many variants for me to worry about, which helps rather a lot. But it's a very localised name and in 1881, out of 146 Cavers people in Britain, over a third were in Roxburghshire and not that much less were in the surrounding counties on the Anglo-Scottish border. So it's, it's very localised. And to show you where these places are, the map on the left, little A marks the spot for Cavers. It's really near the border with England. It's got Perth on that map as well, I like that. And the map on the right shows Roxburghshire, which is one of the old counties. In the 1970s, it was absorbed into the new Scottish borders region with various other border counties. But it's it's an old county and it's where my one name study traces back to. Now, I registered with Goons in 1997, um, but I've been doing the one name study for a long time before then, for over a decade. and. I was sort of thinking, why didn't I register before? And I, I think it was mainly that I didn't really know what Goons had to offer for me. I would read about it occasionally in things like Family Tree magazine. It was this mysterious organisation. I think you had to send off a stamped addressed envelope or something or other to find out more information. And I just didn't do it. I just didn't get round to it. And having a relatively new website at that time was a major encouragement for me because it told me what the society had to offer to me and that what I was doing did come within the remit and I really probably should register especially because I was getting to the point where I gathered so much information that I wanted to get it out there to fellow cavers researchers. I get approximately a dozen queries about my name a year. They, I think they just about all come through the Goons site originally although I do get more coming through my blog now that I'm going to talk about in a little bit about the blog that I started where I'm writing up the family lines, I post information about stray references, interesting stories. Now when somebody gets in touch with me, because I've been researching the name for such a long time and I've put together family trees, I can usually pass on a detailed family tree for them. Um, I do need them to trace their family back a certain distance before I can link up what they've got with what I've got. 
but once I've done that, I can usually give them a lot of stuff. I can also usually put them in touch with descendants of the same line, their cousins, and I think that's quite nice. I do keep a record of everyone who writes to me, their email addresses and how they are related and where they fit in. So if I get a new contact on a specific line, I can contact all the cousins and say, here's a new person for you. I think that's quite important to me. Now, of course, nowadays we're researching in a highly digitised context. It wasn't like that when I started in about 1984-85. Um, and partly because of that, I still have a backlog of pre-internet material. Um, I've got paper box files full of paper notes and family trees and scribbled stuff. But I also have a backlog due to my MS-like illness. Um, my condition fluctuates a lot. I have patches where I'm really, really bad. And I had to put the study on hold for quite a few years while I completed a part-time history PhD. But I just couldn't manage the two. And even now, I have to consider how best I'm going to tackle what's available out there. I mean, with more and more stuff out there, there's a temptation to say, grab it all, grab it all. But, you know, one person can only do so much. And I think you do have to think quite carefully about how you're going to make the most of it. Um, for practical reasons, I tend to focus on pre-1901, or 1901 and earlier, I should say. Um, it also handles privacy issues easier um, if, you're, if you're looking at that period. But I do look at later references. For example, I did look at the 1911 British census when they went online for like England and Scotland. I'm currently poking about in the 1920 Canadian census, so it doesn't stop me. And World War I records as well. Um, but I do tend to focus on 1901 and earlier. Um, because I'm researching a very unusual name, a very rare name, I can concentrate on putting together linked family trees. And I find that more satisfying as a genealogist rather than gathering a long list of unlinked individuals. I think it's different if you're doing a much, much more common surname. You, you would have a different strategy, but for me, this works. Though having said that, this is a section of the events database that I built quite early on in the noughties um, of references to cavers people in all sorts of different records. So, for example, this page, we've got, a, so we've got some OPR references, the parish register references in Scotland before 1855, so marriage and some birth and baptism ref references, got some census returns. It's sorted by name as well. So it, I find that useful because I can then look up uh, people in there and I can start to piece together references to the same individual and start to piece together family trees. And that's really helpful. Um, it's a massive Excel database. Well, it's a spreadsheet, but I'm using it as a database of sorts. Now, I wanted to talk about how I'm moving into social networking. Um, this is something that Guild of One Name Studies members are encouraged to do nowadays. And it's, it can be a really good way of reaching out to people who are researching the name that you're looking at. Now, the first thing I did was I created a dedicated blog. So there's the, the web address for it, Caver's One Name Study at WordPress. I find WordPress really easy to use. Uh, the, the, sl the slowest bit for, it, for me was picking the theme. You, you pick a theme that, that gives you a, a nice picture at the top and, and a, a layout with different sections. And Oh, I, I took a while to do that. But setting up the site itself was really quick. Now, I, I mainly use this, this blog for writing up the Cavers family lines a branch at a time. This is I'm going to talk about this more in a little bit, but this is my way towards um, writing up what I found out ultimately with the aim of producing a book. And I, I would find a book absolutely terrifying with the thought of the scale of it, but one branch at a time, one blog post at a time, I can do that. And then I intersperse these family line posts with references to stray cavers, people that I found, um, newspaper article mentions, court cases. And I also have some bigger subject articles that I've put together. There was one, a nice one I did on cavers soldiers that I'd found from World War One. And another one on Cavers people in the 1881 Canadian census. There were more people with the surname Cavers in Canada in 1881 than there were in Britain. Um, all descended from a relatively small number of emigrants who had rather large families. Now, I have 43 regular blog sub subscribers who get all new updates by email. But I also get other people seeing my blogs. Whenever I do a new blog post on WordPress, it's searchable by Google very, very quickly afterwards. And a lot of people are finding it through Google searches, which is nice. 
and it means that they, they, they do a Google search for their ancestor and they find my page and then they get in touch with me and, and suddenly I've got a new contact for my one name study and they get new information as well and you know that's really good. Moves into social networking part two, um, I created a Facebook group. I'm not a big fan of Facebook. I use it to keep in touch with some family members, but I, I do have some issues with it. But eventually I thought I should create a Facebook group because there are other cavers people out there that I might get in touch with this way. It's also quite nice because people can discuss things on there. They can post comments. You can get some interaction. Now, I emailed all the cavers contacts that I had. Um, I do find the email addresses change over time so they can lapse and stop working. But all those I still had working email addresses for I emailed. Now, many of them joined, but I find that few participate actively, which is a bit of a shame. Um, I, I tend to have to post new information and people will respond to that, but people are less likely to post new information themselves. But it does continue to find new people who are interested in their caver's ancestry. And for that, I find the Facebook group invaluable. More recently, I started a Y DNA study at Family Tree DNA. This is looking at male line descendants of cavers. They have to be all male lines, so no female illegitimacy link in the chain, for example. And it's looking at the different cavers branches and seeing how their DNA compares and if they've got common roots. Um, now, it's very much a long term project. Um, it's only started, it's going to take years to come to fruition and it's an ongoing thing. Unfortunately, people do need to pay for the test kits themselves for, from Family Tree DNA or via goons if they're in the UK, because I can't afford to buy people's kits. Um, but I've suggested to people that if, if, for example, there's one person who's descended from a specific branch, they may be able to club together with their, their close cousins to pay for the kit, which will then give a DNA profile for their branch of the Cavers family. So that's that's one way of sharing the cost and making it more affordable. Now, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that this part of the slide is out of date. I do have one Cavers descendant who signed up for a new kit, and I've got another Cavers descendant who was tested with a different company in the past, but it's possible because of the company they used to transfer the results over. And we have already transferred the results over. And I'm hoping that in about a month, I'll be able to make a blog post saying how the two compare. I do have preliminary results and I'm keeping them close to my chest at the moment. Um, but I should be able to say more in about a month when the full test results for the first person come through. And it, it's all rather exciting. Now, challenges for the future. Um, <clears throat> something I'm very concerned with is legacy planning. I want to share as much information as I found with descendants. For me, it's it's not all about me gathering information and, oh, isn't it great fun? Well, it is great fun, but I want to get it out there to people who are also descended from these lines. Um, the one thing that I've done is I put the events database that I showed you earlier, the spreadsheet, I've put that into Google Docs. I don't particularly like Google Docs. It's quite a clumsy user interface, but it is a way of getting the information out there. And I've put it in there and I've encouraged other Capers researchers to save it and to use it as and how they want. Uh, the other very important thing I'm doing is I'm writing up the family trees and posting them to the blog, one blog post at a time. And that's really good because it's it's got me started writing up the information, whereas before I always thought, well, I'll get on with it later, but now I'm doing it and that's really rewarding. Um, the other thing I'm doing is Try to think how best do I tackle what's on the online now. Um, every time there's a new post to the Goons mail list, I think, oh, I want to go and look at that new resource that's really exciting that somebody's told us all about. And I probably will go and look at that resource, but then if I'm sensible, I'll save looking at it properly for later. Now, ideally, I'd like to publish some of my findings in the form of a book. Um, I'm a former computer scientist. I, I'm very sceptical about data preservation issues and, and data access issues in the future and that if we create data now I'm very skeptical that it's going to still be readable in 50 years time in a lot of cases. I have more faith in books surviving, I'm also a book historian as well, more faith in books surviving than ad hoc digital data kept by individuals. So I'm viewing my Cavers blog where I write up the family lines one blog post at a time. Ultimately it's a step towards a book and it would be possible to collate those blog posts into a book, which I think is, is a really good aim to work for. In conclusion, um, I'm very glad I started the One Name Study back in about 1984 or 85. Um, 
it was a natural extension of my family history studies and as a genealogist it's doing a one name study especially if you've got a, a name that's rare but not too rare but not too common either it's it's just the right size for turning it into a giant genealogy jigsaw puzzle and it's enormous fun I also enjoy helping Caver's descendants piece together their family trees. Um, I get a lot of satisfaction if somebody writes to me about their ancestor and they don't know anything about it. If I can write back and give them masses of information and they're over the moon, I, I think that's great. And I can put them in touch with cousins. Now, some of the people who write to me are related to me. We have the same Caver's ancestral branch, but many aren't. And it doesn't really matter to me whether they are related or not. I get the same pleasure out of helping them. Um, I am making plans for long-term legacy issues, uh, but even despite that, I, even with my illness and everything, I do hope to keep doing the study for quite some time to come. Thank you very much.